Here are implications and kind of ripple effects of climate change, things that may not directly impact you, but we need to be thinking about as, the, as Americans and people in general. Um, so one of the things we have to think about are solutions. We can't stay in that spot of, of carbon is horrible, we're killing the world, blah, blah, blah. Um, so one of the solutions that we're investigating um, is carbon capture and sequestration. Um, I know that's a big word, but it means to catch it and hold it. So you probably have heard that word sequester when they talk about a jury. So it's the same kind of thing. They hold that jury, they're, we're going to hold that carbon dioxide. Um, and the problem right now is it costs a lot. And there's two places we can do that, in oceans and in rocks. Rocks obviously are going to take a long time for that to happen. Oceans are difficult because they have an ocean acidification piece. And we're going to, um, hopefully we'll get a chance to do this in class, but uh, the process involves making this acid, uh, carbonic acid, and um, that's not good for little uh, sea creatures. Um, it makes it so they can't make their shells. And so... Um, if you can figure out how to catch that carbon quickly like the ocean does, but without making the ocean more acidic, um, there's your next million dollars. Another thing is to reduce what fossil fuels we burn. We talked about this a little bit with alternative fuels, but switching to something that's carbon neutral like biofuels so that the carbon that the plant takes out of the atmosphere is the same carbon that goes out. That would help us reduce that human influence on that carbon cycle, um, which is one of the reasons why ethanol is a big deal. Um, so, you know, here in Nebraska, we like our ethanol because that helps our economy. So um, that's we'd like to see everybody in the world use uh, biofuels. Um, and then also using uh, alternative fuels that don't produce carbon dioxide, like wind and solar, whatever. But also, you know, some of those are a little bit out of reach for us. So if we change simple things we can do at home, like changing how we use our electricity. Um, one of the things you can do is avoid peak hours. So if you charge your, charge your devices and use your appliances overnight when most people are asleep, um, they don't have to crank up those those electrical um, that electrical production, and that can help save carbon dioxide. Um, and then also reducing your use. So trying to use natural light instead of turning on the lights. Um, using switching to LED or CFL light bulbs. LEDs are better than CFLs. Um, and then you know, and those can be expensive. So trying to get away from using those incandescent bulbs because um, those incandescent bulbs are the worst. And so, you know, shut off the lights when you leave a room. All those little things can add up. Um, and the reason why we want to move to that solutions is because some of the ripples that we've talked about are kind of directly observable. Um, some of them are things that uh, we are not necessarily going to um, see and measure um, immediately. So one of the things uh, is thermal inertia. We learned in our meteorology unit that water heats and cools slowly. What that means is if we were to wave a magic wand and change everything and make it perfect today, it would still, we'll still see warming trends until the year 2100. It's going to take a long time for that great big ocean that is on our planet to cool off. And so um, we're going to have to be persistent and tenacious in our um, in our solutions and not give up. Um, and part of the reason for that is, and, and the, one of the things we've talked about, I guess not a reason for, but we talked about uh, capacity as well. Um, we have to think about the fact that capacity changes with temperature. So the higher the temperature, um, the more the capacity for water and carbon dioxide, and the more water and carbon dioxide the higher the temperature goes, and that creates a positive feedback loop. And that positive feedback loop um, will reinforce itself rather than shut itself off. Um, and so um, we need to be able to, at some point, put a break in that feedback loop to make it uh, not reinforce itself, and that's, therein lies the challenge. Um, another uh, part of, of the implications of climate change, we again, we talked a little bit about was habitats. Um, mainly you're, we're concerned about the colder climate habitats um, because what will happen is those are going to change altitudes and latitudes. So um, everything's going to kind of move up or towards those cooler climates. And But what happens to the species that prefer those cooler climates? Where do they go? Um, and we're already seeing that increase of invasive species here in Nebraska quite a bit. Um, at the current rate of, of climate change um, of about 3 degrees Celsius, 
Um, the rate of change is similar to the last global mass extinction event that had 92% of species lost. So scientists really um, are concerned that um, that we are actually in one of those uh, uh, mass extinction events. And then, of course, the question becomes, well, who cares? Why, why do I care if, you know, some little bug goes extinct? Well, start thinking about this. So let's say this insect right here goes extinct and it feeds this bird. Well, you're looking at the bird and you're like, well, it's got a different kind of bug in its mouth, of course, because nothing ever eats only one thing, right? And so, but this bug, let's say, then starts to go up in population because this bird's not eating it. And this bug carries this germ and this disease is what makes us sick. At some point, you know, when you or your one of your loved ones falls ill, you're going to be like, "Well, wait a second, how come nobody did anything?" Well, that's called a trophic cascade, and um, those are ones we can't predict. We don't know. Um, there's a video on Blackboard called "How Wolves Change Rivers," and I would highly encourage you to look at. You know, that was something that that humans didn't understand how we were going to impact Yellowstone National Park by getting rid of wolves, and so. Um, when we look at stuff like mass extinction events, this is one of the reasons why it freaks scientists out so much because we don't know what's going to happen. Um, then th tundra thawing um, is another kind of ripple effect um, that has bigger implications. So the cooler climates get warmer and the tundra thaws. Well, so the tundra is made up of water and then um, some old dead plant material. So as it thaws, that water drains away. And so what happens is the land collapses. And so you can kind of see here how the land is collapsed. To give you a size of scale, these are full-size trees. And right in here, you can see a little guy, right? And the dude, um, and the dude has his arms crossed and is kind of standing on a boulder. So you can kind of see... Um, you can kind of see where uh, that person is right there. So um, what we've got there is when that happens, all the little dead bacteria inside the, the old uh, dead plant matter wakes up and starts burping out methane. Well, methane is 10 times as powerful a greenhouse gas as carbon dioxide. And so um, that increases the global warming and increases tundra thaw and all that. And also, when you look, if you look up tundra thaw, you'll find pictures of Alaskan homes, communities that are just decimated by um, that collapse and those sinkholes that are happening. Um, so um, part of that problem is, you know, it doesn't impact us, but it's impacting people elsewhere. And it's our own self-centeredness that kind of keeps us from thinking about that. Um, and then the last one boils down to physiology. Um, you know, when you look at that mass extinction event, we're probably going to be in that 8% that survives, right? We're human beings. We have thinking brains. We have engineering minds, and we're problem solvers, so we'll stay alive. However, we have to also think about what range can humans stay alive in. Um, so one of the things that we're uh, studying right now are tuna. Um, and tuna, you don't think about how big a tuna is, but it's about me-sized. So I'm 5'5". Five, five. Um, so picture me standing there for a large group and now make it a fish shape, okay? So that's how big a tuna is. So their hearts are about the same size as ours. They are like humans in that they can survive in cold and hot temperatures. So they feed up near the poles where it's cold and they breed in the Gulf of Mexico where it's warm. And what we're seeing is that um, tuna hearts are failing when they get to those warmer climates, um, when they're in that Gulf. So the Gulf is already starting to get too warm for them. So the question becomes, when will that happen for us? Um, and so if you're interested in climate change and you're also interested in physiology, maybe that's another place that you could um, continue your career. Um, these are all just ripple effects of climate change, um, things to think about uh, both in your graded discussion and um, in your life moving forward. Um, if you have any questions, as always, make sure you let your instructors know. Thank you, Warriors.